Welcome to the Grace Writers Podcast, Christian writers changing popular culture. Hit subscribe on your favourite podcast player so you never miss an episode. And find show notes, useful links and a full transcript at gracewriters.com. Today on the podcast, Christian non-fiction author, mother of three and baseball wife, Billy Jouse. I'm Belinda Pollard. I'm an author, editor and book coach with a theology degree and 20 years in the publishing industry. I blog for writers at smallbluedog.com and you can find links to my books, blogs and online courses at belindapollard.com. Hi, my name is Alison Young. I'm a former early childhood educator with four adult children. Aside from writing, my other passion is photography and as part of the media team at my local church, I have the privilege of capturing God moments, both big and small. I write contemporary romance under the name Alison Joy, and you can find out more about my books at alisonjoywriter.com. Hi, I'm Danita Bundy. For the past 20 years, I've been using my theology degree to underpin my preaching, and more recently, to inspire my urban fantasy series, Armour of Light. You can find out more about me and my other endeavours like my book cover design and my blog at donitabundy.com, D-O-N-I-T-A-B-U-N-D-Y. Billy Jouse is the author of two books, Making Room and Destruction Detox. She speaks across America and is the host of the Family Room podcast, which provides practical biblical guidance and challenging motivation for women who want to accomplish God's best in their faith, family and friendships. Billy and her husband, Dave, a professional baseball coach, spend the baseball season on the road and the off season in Southwest Florida. Welcome to the podcast, Billy. Thank you guys for having me. So Billy, to help our audience get to know you a bit better, we like to ask our guests to answer the rapid fire five questions. Are you up for that? Oh yes, let's go. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> so who is your target audience? My target audience is women between 30 and 45 years old who love Jesus, but just don't feel like they're where they're supposed to be. I'd like to say that I'd love to help them find peace in the chaos wherever they are, and also to show the love of Jesus to others wherever God's put them with whomever he's put in front of them. So it's sort of finding that rhythm as a mom and wife. So what is your main genre? I write nonfiction. So I write spiritual growth, discipleship. I I want to challenge women to find God's best in their life while seeking Jesus wholeheartedly. What is your optimum time for writing? Ah, whenever the creative spirit hits me, could be any time. I love writing in the afternoon, evenings is my best time. I am not a morning person. Might be a side effect of being in baseball all these years. But uh, I like writing in the early afternoon, early evening. So do you have a favorite place where you like to write? You know, it's so funny. I have an office here that I've been blessed with now that we have an empty nest. I have an office in my house. So I have a lot of my writing stuff in here. But I often find myself sitting on the couch with my feet on the coffee table and just writing away. Yeah. So can you briefly tell us how you got into writing? Uh, kicking and screaming while Jesus drug me there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that's fabulous. Um, so <laughs> you maybe didn't want to be a writer, Billy. We're just picking that up. Um, so can you tell us how did the first book come about then? Yeah, um, I, I had been a stay-at-home mom. I was an ICU nurse. I had been a stay-at-home mom for a lot of years, homeschooling my kids because with my husband's job, we traveled a lot. We've lived in 15 different cities and towns in the U.S., Dominican Republic and Venezuela, and we drug our kids to all those places. So I had been a stay-at-home mom chasing my husband with three boys along the way. And my baby boy was in his junior year of high school. And a friend of mine contacted me and said, do you want to help me guinea pig this book? She was writing a blog. She was a homeschool mom. And she wrote a blog on how to write a novel in 10 minutes a day because she had five kids. She was homeschooling. I don't know how she did anything, (laughs) but she blogged and she wrote novels in 10 minutes a day. And so I said, Catherine, I'm a writer. Why are you asking me to help? And she said, haven't you been writing devotions 
for Baseball Chapel, which is baseballchapel.org, has daily devotions for women on their website. She goes, haven't you been writing those for 10 years? I'm like, yeah, but I just write it on like a, a, a Word document and send it to a lady and she makes it look good. She puts it out there and she goes, Billy, that's what a writer is. And I was like... <laughs> I never thought about it. You know, it was just baseball experience, a scripture, what Jesus did in my life, how to apply it to your life. And, and I didn't realize the whole time that I was writing these devotions. I know that sounds odd, but I guess in my scientific mind, I didn't really think about it. I'm busy with the kids. And then I started with her and just started falling in love with writing. And my son's senior year of high school, last year of high school, I started praying, Lord, I don't know who I am without my kids in the house. Because as a professional baseball coach, when my husband's on the field with a major league team during the season, he's gone eight months and he doesn't come home. They don't have very many off days. They don't have. So we pack up and go to him. So anything done between February and October is done pretty much alone with the kids, except for June, July, August, when we're with him. And I didn't know who I was. What am I going to do? I don't, what's next? Like, Lord, what do you have for me? Because I'm lost in this. I don't know who I am. And he said, right. And I'm like, man, you and Catherine, what is this with writing? I don't know. And so I started an undercover blog. I didn't tell anybody about it. And It just started picking up some traction with some other people that I was meeting through writing. And the Lord's like, I want you to write a book. And I'm like, yeah, right. And I grew up in North Carolina in the United States. And North Carolina, where I grew up, is very rural, very country. And so and my accent now is not what my accent is when I'm with my family. It's much more of a country Southern accent. And I said, Lord, I don't even speak English. How am I going to write it? And he just kept putting me in front of people that I could ask questions. And I learned more and more. And 18 months later, I got a book contract, which was terrifyingly too fast because I didn't know what I was doing. And and that whole thing sent me in a tailspin after that first book came out. So, but in that, that's, you know, I was kicking and screaming and Jesus kept opening doors and putting people in front of me to help me. And to teach me. And I love to learn. So that was another thing. And what was the like the technique that you used for writing? I honestly wrote like I wrote devotions. I would write chapter and I still write that way because that's like my comfort zone of writing. I start with a story. I do. I have a scripture and a teaching and then practical steps as to how to apply that to your life. Because I love Jesus with all my heart. But sometimes when people say to me, oh, just pray about it. Oh, just read God's word. I'm like, yeah, but how do I put that faith into steps? How do I move forward in this? So I'd love to challenge people and have practical steps, practical tips, practical things that they can apply what we're reading in the Bible to their life. So my first book, Making Room, it was about external distractions, right? all the busy stuff in our life. And that came about in that sense of, of, of trying to figure out, you know, how to write and how to go through that process. What worked and like, what didn't, did you kind of test and adjust as you went on the process itself? Yes, I did. I read a lot of books on writing, you know, just a lot of different books on writing. I followed a lot of blogs. I looked at different people's styles. And one of the things when I was homeschooling my kids, we got a writing program out of Canada. And I loved the way that it taught my kids how to write (laughs) terribly so because it was basically plagiarism. You take someone's writing and you make it better, right? And so In teaching my kids that, I became very good at looking at someone's writing and figuring out the style, the breakdown of it, what what I liked to read and what I didn't like to read, the flow that I liked in it. My books are very conversational. I want someone to pick up a book and feel like they're sitting in my family room with me with a cup of coffee 
just chatting, you know, my podcast, same thing. Like, I just want you to be my friends and hang out and let's learn to love Jesus more, find peace in that chaos and move where Jesus wants us to move, finding the best in our lives of what God wants to do in and through us. Regardless of what kind of writing we do, a lot of us suffer from negative self-talk, insecurity and internal discouragement. Did you struggle with these? And if so, how did you overcome them? Yeah. So after my first book, I told you I struggled a lot. It happened too fast. I really didn't know what I was doing or what was expected of me or, you know, I just fell into imposter syndrome. Somebody's going to write a review on my book and tell me that I'm a horrible writer I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm doing. Some theologian's going to come by and say, you have no right to talk to people about the Bible. All these things that came up in my head. And it sent me, that's the beginning of this downward spiral that I went into that held me back from writing for a couple of years. Like it stopped me. It stuck me in a place that I knew God did not intend me to be. I knew I was not wrong and that God had called me to write, but all those negative thoughts in my head were driving me crazy. Like I, I knew it was wrong, but I knew I needed, you know, I knew I was having those thoughts and I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. And I knew I needed to take care of it. So I started through a process in, in the writing. I never really stopped writing I just stopped writing with purpose. I'd still write this, that, or the other. I'd still, you know, sit down and write a silly story or write something that had happened to me, but not with purpose to to publish it for anyone to see it, for anyone to know. And um, I really got to that deep negative place. And I said to my husband one day, I go, this isn't right. I've got to do something. I was becoming critical. I was becoming just negative. Everything was negative. What was in me was negative. What was coming out of me was negative. And so I sat down and I thought to myself, I'm going to write down all the negative thoughts that I'm having, writing again, right? I'm just going to write my negative thoughts all day, every day for seven days. And I had a little notebook and it's in here somewhere, a little notebook. And I carried it around with me with a pen attached to the spiral. And I'd write down every negative thought I had and I wouldn't look at it. And on that seventh day, I was at home. It was a Sunday night and I was sitting there alone and I opened that notebook and I started reading all those negative thoughts. And that's when I realized I was my biggest bully. No one had ever said those things to me. I would never say those things to my children, my husband, my friends. I wouldn't even say most of those things to a stranger. Like it was just horrible the way I was talking to myself. And that's when I knew, man, I have to do something completely different because these thoughts, I would have a thought and it would just spiral down. So I'd have a thought of you're not a good enough writer. And then the next negative thought would be, you've never been good enough. Nobody cares about you. Nobody wants you. You're dumb. You're the, I mean, it just, I couldn't believe it when I saw it all together. And so I started a process, told you guys I'm a process person. And I started a process of really digging in my Bible, reading about, you know, our thoughts and I've never been a big fan of, oh, take the thought captive, take that thought captive, because that's in our abilities. And we don't have the ability to take that thought captive. And so when I went through this, I, I went through it one at a time and looked at the thought, evaluated it, like, where did it come from? Why do I think this? You know, what's the surroundings of it? Is it about my writing? Is it about me being a mom? Is it about me being a wife? Whatever it was. And I evaluated it. How does it make me feel? How where where is it taking me? Is it is it making me be challenged and move forward, or is it keeping me stuck? You know, is it is it encouraging me? No, <laughs> it's really breaking me down. And that's when I went into another just digging into scripture and finding scripture that gave me the truth rather than the lies that I was telling myself. That's fabulous. After I started going through that process of figuring out what those toxins were, evaluating them in the sense of how do they make me feel, where are they coming from? And some of them, I don't know where they come from. 
Some of them I did. A, a high school teacher told me in ninth grade that I didn't understand books when I read them. I didn't read another book until I was 26 years old, 26. So about 10 years, let's say. And I never read another book because she told me I didn't know how to understand them. And here we found ourselves in Venezuela at the time that everything was Spanish speaking, TV, everything. I was learning Spanish, but in the afternoons when the boys slept, I had nothing to do. So I found a little store and they had a lending library in the corner and there were American books, English speaking books there. And she challenged me to take one, a sweet German lady that was living in Venezuela. And I took the smallest book I could find because I thought maybe this small book I'll be able to understand. And that winter I read, uh, I think, 71 books. Now, some of them were too tiny, but I read 71 books over that time, ending up reading longer books because all of a sudden I took what that lady said away and began to read. And that's where I wanted to be in these negative thoughts. And that turned into a book because what happened was I went to Facebook and I was like, Hey, people, my friends, do any of you struggle with negative thoughts, like negative thoughts in the (laughs) sense of you're not good enough or you're not, what are you struggling with? And boy, the barrage of information I got back, I could have written three books, but they fell into three very distinct categories, fear, doubt, and the third category being two things, but I don't think you can do one without the other is shame and guilt. So is that your second book? That is my second book, Distraction Detox. And it's removing emotional barriers to realize God's best. Mm -hmm. Because we can't find God's best when we're telling ourselves we're not good. We're not loved. We're not accepted. We don't belong. We're afraid of everything. I'm afraid if I write that and put it out there, somebody's going to say something wrong about it or that I don't know what I'm doing or I don't have a theology degree, so I can't write about scripture in the Bible or I'm not a life coach. How do I help people move in a, a direction? And those doubts keep us, the fear of some of comparison. I put comparison under fear because we're afraid we're not going to match up to someone else. Don't we all compare? I mean, even when you guys were going through yours, I'm like, oh, she's so good at that. I'm not good at that. And I was like, nope, got to stop that thought. And that's where in that process of as soon as I have a thought, and I'm not great at it all the time. This book is not a one and done, get over it, move on. It's learning the habit of when you have that thought, stop it and replace it with a scripture. And when you replace it with a scripture, your mind goes to a different place. You know, when I lack in confidence on my wall, I have all these scriptures on my wall. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Not awards and accolades, and but in your confidence, you're going to do what God's asked you to do. And he, you will receive what he has promised. You know, that peace, that fulfillment, that acceptance from him, all of that lies within us being able to be confident in what we're doing and what we're writing. Can we just backtrack a little bit to your first book, Making Room? You suggest that we do less so God can do more. This sounds great, but also kind of impossible. Can you break it down for (laughs) us? Explain what this looks like. Yeah. So when I did the first book, I was living in a space of so many busy things going on, right? We have so many things going on. And as soon as we get things going on that we don't want to do, what do we do? We pick up our phones and we start scrolling and we start looking at social media and then we fall into comparison and then we fall into not being good enough. And, you know, it's like there was so much going on in my life at that time that (laughs) it's funny because one night I came home and I said to my husband, I have this great idea and 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 we need to do this and, and we need to do that. And it was all very good. It was about a charity. I wanted to step in and, and do some great things with this charity. And my husband goes, you know, you've got the right hand syndrome. I'm like, right hand syndrome? He goes, yeah. Anybody that says we need help with, you go, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. 
He said, you shoot your right hand up every time. So making room, and and I will say, my books are life lived out. I don't just come up with an idea and do a book. It is life lived out. And that's where making room came in before I was going to write a book. All that time that people were saying, you need to write, you need to write, you need to write. I went into and did a 31 day blog series, 31 straight days. It was a challenge someone gave me. I did 31 straight days of blogging. And what was I blogging about? Busyness. I don't feel like I have enough time for God because I'm too busy. Am I doing all the questions? Am I doing the right thing? Am I am I going in the direction he needs me to go? Am, am I using my time wisely? Am I stewarding the money that we're given well? Am I spending time with my children like I should as one's heading out of the house? All those questions kept getting filled with, well, this is on my calendar and I have a meeting at 10. I can't get up and read my Bible today because I have a meeting. I got to prepare for that meeting. And then I'm leaving the meeting. I'm going to lunch and I'm leaving lunch. I'm going. So I never gave God time to speak into me. I'd read my Bible. I'd listen, you know, to different things. I'd, well, I'd listen to sermons. I go to church. I have Bible study, but was I truly sitting and allowing the Lord to speak into my life? in the places that I could do what he was asking me to do, not what I thought I should be doing. I really did get my schedule under control. And I did learn to say yes and no. I I learned to listen to God's guidance rather than just me being I want to, I want people to like me. So I'm going to just raise my hand and volunteer for everything so that they look at me and say, oh, she's so good at doing it. But I don't know about you guys. When we volunteer for everything, we get a little overwhelmed with all the things. And we also, one of the things I realized is I was taking opportunities for other people to step up and do those things. So it just wasn't about me. It was about the people around me. That's an interesting perspective, actually. If if I yeah. do the thing that is not my calling, I'm actually mm-hmm. getting in the way of someone else's calling. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. An opportunity for someone to serve the Lord. And I'm a pretty, I don't know, you guys have probably figured it out by now. I'm a pretty driven person. I'm a pretty big personality. <laughs> and I can just go in and bulldoze and get things done and It doesn't always mean that's what God wants me to do. Sometimes he wants me to step back and say, hey, Miss Quiet One sitting over here, what do you think about helping with this? I'll help you if you need help, but why don't you step into this? Or, you know, my friend that's trying to run out the back door because she doesn't want to be around a certain group of people. Hey, how about giving them a chance? How about just staying a little longer, digging in, asking questions? Whatever it may be, it's giving people opportunity to step in where God may need them to be or want them to be in that moment. So in your, um, there there seems to be this theme in in the distraction detox and the making room about finding that place, that quiet place where we can hear, listen, discern, get that perspective, get that direction. Um, can you tell us how you found that or how give advice or some tips about how, how other people can find that quiet place? Decreasing my calendar, like getting my calendar under control gave me more time to read God's word. I didn't read it in passing or as writers, if we're writing nonfiction or fiction, because Uh, you know, Christian fiction writers are going to have that scarlet thread through it of a theme, a biblical theme. You're reading your Bible to get information to teach someone else. So instead of the doing, it's the pausing. Pause. Before I wrote the book, Making Room, I really got my calendar under control and I was spending more time with Jesus. But that was in that time that I figured out, yeah, I'm spending more time with Jesus, but I'm telling him, yeah, God can't love me like it says in the Bible because I did bad things in my past. Maybe God can't use me like that because I, I, I never read a book in high school. I went through college. I have a bachelor of science in nursing and didn't read a book. I read text. I read educational things, but not a book like a novel or, you know, anything for pleasure. There was no reading of stories. 
And so I have all these things in my head that'll be like, yeah, that's good for someone else. Let me pray for you, but not to sit in that pause of a moment and just be still. You know, that the scripture be still and know that I am God. Be still. And being still is hard for me. Just to be still. And sometimes that doesn't mean sitting in a chair quietly because I don't know about you guys, but as a mom, when my kids were young, I didn't have five minutes. I mean, I'd go to the bathroom and they'd follow me. You know, mm-hmm. as adults, they still do that at times. They may cover their <laughs> face. And they're like, mom, I'm like, excuse me. So what privacy do we have? But it's finding those moments of pause when we can read Bible stories to our kids or read the Bible to the kids or in the car when you're playing mom taxi between one sporting event and another or school or dance or theater or whatever it may be that you can put. Um, the a reading of the Bible on your on your phone. Now I work out the past three weeks. I've been working out listening to the Bible because I usually listen to podcasts. I, you know, I love podcasts. I love listening to lots of podcasts, but I'm like, you know what? I've been so busy writing for other people, teaching, speaking for other people that I need to take that time and pause and listen to God's word. So, Billy, the Grace Writers slogan is Christian Writers Changing Popular Culture. What are your thoughts on that? My love is people. I love people. And that doesn't mean they're all Christians. But I never waver from my beliefs or my thoughts or loving as Jesus does. You know, people that don't agree with me on anything. I I just I tend to pray for people because I I talk to them and I ask them questions about their life and their struggles and and I end up praying with them. And so changing popular popular culture, I believe, starts with loving like Jesus loves us. Love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? It's not the person living next door to you only. It's the person you're walking through the door, meeting at the door of a cafe that you'll never see again. But who knows in that moment, that smile, that thank you, that hello, that good morning, that good evening can send them in a trajectory that the next person may be able to to talk to them about something deeper. We're not responsible for the entire outcome of changing popular culture, right? I believe we can one step at a time, one interaction at a time. Loving on one person at a time, if that's for a second or a lifetime. Thanks so much, Billy. Some great stuff there for us to think about. How how can people find you online? The best place to find me is my website, billyjouse.com, B-I-L-L-I-E-J-A-U-S-S.com. And on there also, you'll find a distraction detox quiz and that will help you figure out what of the three categories you you're you're going to conquer. I don't do the quiz saying you're suffering from fear. I say you're a fear fighter because you've already taken this first step into it. A doubt destroyer, a shame shatterer. So I have that on the website too. That sounds excellent. How about I pray for you and the Grace Riders as we finish up? Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Billy and that she's come to join us today and for all of her creativity and perspective that you have um, revealed to us through her today. I pray that you will continue to bless her with her writing, give her inspiration and strength and peace. And I pray for all the other grace writers out there, especially those of us who are dealing with fear and doubt and shame and guilt or just Mm. immense distraction. And I I pray that you will bless us and work within us and guide us as to what it is that you want us to be doing as we move forward in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Billy Jouse, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you, Danita Bundy and Alison Joy. I'm Belinda Pollard, and we'll see you next time on the Grace Writers Podcast. Grace Writers is run by volunteers, and we're incredibly grateful to those who have contributed financially to help keep this ministry running. Thank you so very much. If you have enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to help, 
please go to gracewriters.com and look for Donate in the menu. Continue today's conversation in our free online forum and find useful articles, links and resources at gracewriters.com. Mm-hmm.